Hello, um, it gives me huge pleasure to welcome Jamie Bartlett to the Science Gallery Dublin and to all of you. Um, according to Google's search algorithm, Jamie Bartlett is a well-known South African actor, best known for his role as the wicked puppet master David Gennaro on TV show Rhythm City. He's also, luckily for the talk today and for the sake of my questions, the director of the Centre for the Analysis of Social Media at Demos, which is Britain's leading cross-party think tank. And when I went on the site today, it actually has a really annoying pop-up if you go into it through Chrome, so you might want to sort that out when we're done here. Um, he's a journalist and writer. He's the author of The Darknet, which takes its name from a, short, a shorthand to describe the hidden and encrypted part of the internet beyond the reach of normal browsers, accessible using an anonymous browser called Tor. Um, this vast, often hidden network of sites, communities, and cultures is where freedom is pushed to its limits and where people can be anyone. Because in the dark net, no one knows you're a dog with a BDSM fetish and a sideline and uh, dealing crack. Jamie's book looks at many of these subcultures, um, some of them benign, many of them enterprising, and more than a few of them that are really deeply disturbing. So if you've read the book, you'll, you'll know exactly what we're talking about. Um, but more than that, I think it looks at the sort of everyday aspects of these sites on the dark net and on the regular internet, and tries to understand why people go there and why they use them. The answers uh, are usually very human, and they're almost never in black and white or ones and zeros. But to tell you more, I'll hand you over to Jamie himself. All right. Thank you so much. And thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you very much for having me. It's uh, really a great honor to be here. Um, do you all notice that Edward Snowden joined Twitter yesterday? Yeah, and did you see that one account he's following? He's just following one other account, the NSA. <laughs> he's going to become one of the Internet's great trolls. And trolls uh, is, uh, well, they're one of the reasons I wrote this book. And I want to just start with a very brief story about why I spent much of 2013 and 14 in hidden and strange internet subcultures. And then I'm going to tell you a couple of specific stories from the dark net, meaning Tor hidden services, this network of sites. And it was in mid-2013 that I was on a site called 4chan. Have any of you been on 4chan before? Some of you maybe have, yeah. It's, uh, I'm bored of it, but it's a very, very interesting uh, image-sharing board where everybody posts anonymously. Um, almost about anything they want, but there's a real culture of, uh, of, of sort of censorship-free material. Anything goes. Everyone posts, or the majority of people anyway, post under a pseudonym, anonymous which, by the way, is where the anonymous hacktivist group took their, took their name from. And I was there, rather interested in this weird community, and seeing the limits to which people would push anonymity. And I saw something deeply disturbing. And there's a culture on 4chan, on one of the boards in particular, called um, camming, webcamming. This is where usually young women post naked photographs of themselves, which they upload to the image board, and they take requests. People ask them to do certain things. They're at home with their phone, uh, and they sort of respond to these requests, and then they upload them onto 4chan. But because they're posting anonymously, they don't give away any details about themselves. They think it's all rather safe. Lots of reasons why people do that. Now, I was watching as this was happening, and this one young woman, she was 18 years old, 19, she was at university, was doing exactly this, what hundreds of people have done before her. There was probably a few thousand people watching the thread as she was, every 30 seconds or so, uploading another naked photograph of herself. She then said to the board that she was on medication, and people watching posted anonymously, could you please post a photograph of the medication that you're on. And she did it. And then someone else said, could you please post a photograph of yourself uh, with your first name written across your chest? This is something that, that people do. And she did it. Well, that was quite obviously very foolish and very naive, because almost immediately the entire board changed. Rather than requesting 
things for her to do, they suddenly decided they had enough information contained within those two posts to find out who she was in real life. And they decided they were going to find out who she was in real life. And so very, very quickly, because of the medication, they found the doctor's name and they found the town that she was from. They worked out, it was North America, worked out the universities that she likely went to, went through the yearbook of that year, found a picture that matched her and matched her first name, found her Facebook page and her Twitter feed. This, by the way, took about three minutes. She was watching this happen. Before she could delete her Facebook profile, they had grabbed every single name of every friend that she had on Facebook. Someone else, in the meantime, created a montage of all those photographs that she had shared with that board. You can see where this story is going, can't you? And then they started sending that montage of photos to every friend she had on Facebook, every friend of her friend, her parents, her parents' friends, her tutors at university, her tutors' friends, and so on. And then they managed to find her phone number and phone her house up to tell her what they'd done. And this whole thing took about 10 minutes. And I just thought, I can't believe I'm so, well, I, couldn't, I can't believe what I'm seeing. And that's sort of, I'm rather naive with that. Uh, but I thought, I've got to tell this story. People are going to do stupid things on the internet just like they do stupid things in the real world. I'd rather they knew some of the risks that were involved. And it got me really interested in the limits that people go to when they're anonymous, whether it's being exhibitionist like she was and being very naive and foolish, or being very mean and cruel like the other anonymous people that decided to find out who she was and share all of those photos with everybody that she knew. And so for the next uh, nine months after that, I tried to immerse myself as best I could in a series of different internet subcultures, ranging from the normal internet, the internet that we all use every day on Facebook and YouTube and forums and blogs. So I was looking at uh, internet trolls and neo-Nazis, pro-anorexia sites, illegal pornography networks, uh, homemade pornography, but also the hidden internet, the, t the, the dark net, as it's called, Tor Hidden Services, and what happens there. And that's the, the couple of stories that I'm going to tell you about today. Now, I do have uh, a clicker here. Now, has anybody been on to uh, Tor Hidden Services onto the dark net? Everyone's always a bit sort of shy about putting their hands up. <laughs> OK, a few people. I'll explain briefly what it is. Back in, in the mid-90s, US naval intelligence wanted to come up with a way of allowing their officers to browse the internet without them giving away their IP address, their location. Very good reasons why you'd want to do that. Me as a journalist, I want to go into neo-Nazi forums and understand what they're talking about. I don't want them to know what my IP address is, uh, which they will know if I go into their forum, because it will lead directly back to my home address. Obviously, I'd rather they didn't know that. So you can understand why naval intelligence would like to do that. And they built this amazing, um, a, a, a amazing piece of software, which they called TOR, stands for the Onion Router. And essentially, what it does is this. It takes your IP address, it encrypts it, um, so it sort of scrambles it, essentially, so it's a bit of a meaningless jumble of numbers and letters. It then bounces your request for a website via usually three other computers around the world that can be anywhere around the world using the same software, so that when it comes out at the other end and tries to get to the website, it doesn't give away your original IP address. It gives the IP address of the final computer that it spat your, IP, your request out of. This is very, very, very clever stuff and was a brilliant piece of software engineering. Here's a little sort of description of how it actually works. I won't go into too much of the detail. Maybe we can later. Amazing. Brilliant. Allows you to browse the normal internet without giving away your IP address. This is fantastic. The only problem at the time was it was really only US naval intelligence that could do this. And because it's a non-standard protocol, uh, it's rather obvious to anyone at the other end if you're using this. So 
if you're naval intelligence, everybody knows it's you. So the whole point is kind of lost. So anyway, they decided, well, what we'll do instead, we'll open source this, we'll make this a piece of open software code so anyone can work on it and develop it and anyone can use it. And then we, the intelligence agencies or whoever else, can hide in the traffic as well. Funnily enough, the internet itself is also a US military project in the beginning. So they open sourced this software, this browser, and it became very, very popular, particularly among journalists and activists, uh, especially in parts of the world where internet freedom is not really respected. So during the Arab Spring, if that's still the term people are using, I'm not sure, uh, it was very, very widely used to keep people safe online. So not only is it very good for privacy, because it keeps your IP address safe and hidden, because you're bouncing it around the world, it's also very good to circumnavigate censorship. Because if you have a sort of block on a series of IP addresses within a country, this will get around it too, because the IP address is not one that's in your blocked list. So good for circumnavigating censorship, good for maintaining your privacy. So this is the browser. This is the browser. Rather more recently, though, and I don't, even though I wrote a book about this, I couldn't get to the origins. Someone worked out, well, you can also use similar sort of system of encryption, but for the websites as well as the browser. So you could build websites using this, which would make them very, very difficult to locate and very, very difficult to censor because you could hide where the servers were on which they were based. When you want to remove, let's say the BBC runs a, uh, a story and a, it's a lead, for some reason the government wants it offline, they turn up with a warrant. Well, you know where the server is, where that website is hosted and you can remove it. If you don't know where the server is, it's actually very difficult to get something off the internet. And so somebody worked out that, well, why don't we just have some websites that use the same system and also you, that you access with this browser, but that are very, very difficult to remove. And this is what became known as the darknet, the Tor hidden services. Somewhere you can go with a browser that keeps you anonymous, accessing sites that are incredibly difficult to censor or remove. That is the darknet. That is Tor hidden services. There are, it is thought, somewhere between five and 50,000 of these sites. It's very, very difficult to know. It's very difficult to measure. They are a string. The URLs are a string of meaningless numbers and letters that end in dot onion. You can't get to them with your normal browser. You need this Tor browser. And that's the dark net. I'm not going to stop there, by the way. Be in. Thank you very much. <laughs> so. Obviously, this is a really good place to go if you have something to hide or if you don't want to be found. And so as a result, I'm going to run through some of the sites that you will find there. Um, but this is the message I want to give to you. This, these places aren't always what they seem. And I'm going to illustrate that with a couple of stories. But first, here's a handful of the sorts of things you can find. You can, By the way, my book, I know they're selling it back here and my publisher will kill me, but you can get pirated copies of that on the dark. Now that's, <laughs> I'd be sort of upset if you couldn't, to be honest. So illegal drugs markets. We're going to get a lot more into that in a moment. Don't worry. Uh, pirated books, as I've said. Professional hack services, i.e., would you like us to hack a computer for you? That's going to cost you $50 and so on. Um, there is a, a huge amount of illegal pornography available on these sites. Um, but here's the thing. As I said, it's important to bear in mind. This is a good place if you have something to hide. And the reason the Tor browser was so much loved by um, uh, activists is not because of the bad stuff, but because of the good stuff, or the stuff that you can at least see a strong social purpose for. Whistleblowing sites are incredibly popular on the Tor hidden services. The New Yorker has one, so it is actually pretty legit. And OK, I'll get back to that. The New Yorker has one, and actually increasingly, 
I don't know if any of you saw this in the news, but Facebook has recently opened a tour hidden service. I'll go into why they have later on. The musician Apex Twin released his last album as a tour hidden service. I actually think some of this might be going pretty mainstream. There are now something like between two and three million daily users of the Tor browser, a proportion of which we don't know exactly how many are going on to this dark net, these Tor hidden services. And as I said, it's kind of the extremes. It's the people with something to hide. And that's good and bad. Now I'm going to start with this. This is how I start my book, in fact. And it is, a, as you can see, a way of crowdfunding assassinations. Probably one of the most shocking sites I've ever seen. But, and here's the sort of theme I want to bring out, actually unbelievably inventive. No one, as far as I know, has ever been assassinated using this. And I think this, this is the problem writing a book about the internet. The minute you publish it, it's all out of date already. So this site, I believe, is now down. But let me explain how this works. Well, you can read one to four there. So essentially, people add a name. And they contribute money to the pool next to that person's name. Other people can predict what, when that person will die. And correct predictions will get the pool. So whatever it is. Now there's a fifth, not on this page, on the next page, there's a fifth rule, which is fulfilling the predictions is entirely up to you. And this is the idea, of course. This was, a, this was the brainchild of a 1990s radical libertarian who thought that with the onset of digital technology, we could create a perfect marketplace for assassinating political leaders. Because he thought, this is how you do it. You'd use an anonymous web browser to go onto one of these sites. You would anonymously put a cryptocurrency next to people's names. An assassin at some point would say, oh my goodness, there's 40 bitcoins next to Barack Obama. Well, that's worth thousands of dollars now. So I'm going to, with a unique digital key, I am going to make my prediction. And my prediction is going to be 7 o'clock on Wednesday, the 30th of September. And when that prediction is uh, proved to be correct, I can, that file of cryptocurrency is posted anonymously online. And only the person with that unique key that made the prediction can unlock the file to receive the money. All of it is done without anybody giving away anything about themselves. You don't know who put the money in the pool. You don't know who collected the money. The person who runs the website can say, I don't know anyone who's doing this. I've just set up a gambling system. It's nothing to do with me. It's not illegal. Is this illegal? It's just a gambling system. And Jim Bell, the person who thought this up, dreamt that it would lead to a world without politicians. Because none of them would dare. He said there'd be, there would be no Stalin, there would have been no Hitler if we'd have had this, because none of them would have dared even run for office. Because there would have been this constant pressure on them that crowd-funded assassinations would take them out if they upset anybody. And he dreamt this up as an amazing sort of weird thought experiment. But the technology in 1994, when he came up with this, didn't exist. But in 2013, after the Edward Snowden revelations, someone said, the technology is now here. We can do this. And this is what the site looked like. And there was actually money being put next to these people. And this site was up and running. Now, I find this to be obviously an awful way of incentivizing crowd behavior. But it is also an incredibly clever way of imagining how you can anonymously incentivize crowd behavior. And that's one of the messages that I want to get across here. Even in the sort of darkest depths with the most seemingly terrible sites, under the conditions of anonymity, people can be incredibly inventive. And you may find some unexpected benefits therein. 
So let me turn to the next slide, which is the Silk Road. And I always start by asking if anybody's ever bought drugs off the Silk Road before. And no one ever puts their hands up when I answer. I, did, I asked a load of police officers that once, and they just burst out laughing. Hmm. OK. Well, I did. And um, I'm going to tell you how. I'm not going to tell you how. I'm not going <laughs> to... I'm going to tell you how, but without telling you how to do it exactly. But the truth is, it's actually incredibly simple. Now, um, the Silk Road was set up in, I think it was 2011, uh, to be an anonymous marketplace using the Tor browser and the cryptocurrency Bitcoin to be a marketplace in almost anything at all. Of course, it very quickly became mainly about drugs, but drugs weren't the only thing bought and sold on this site. Uh, in April 2013, the number one selling item on the Silk Road was fake £20 Tesco vouchers that were being sold for £8 <laughs> each. So anything. But a lot of counterfeit money, counterfeit passports, identification, but especially drugs. And I'm going to tell you the moral dilemma that this actually created that I wasn't expecting. Now, let me just explain how this works. So you have your Tor browser, you go on, you create a username, and then you arrive at the sort of opening page. And of course, it looks very familiar, doesn't it? it just, I mean, if you've been on Amazon or eBay, this is all perfectly familiar stuff to you. You have you know, your detailed detailed sort of description of your product. You have the high resolution image. You have the price. Look at that button there, report this item. I.e., if you think this is not an accurate description of this product, let the administrator know. You have the price and so on. And if you look, it is clearly modeled on, 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 e on eBay. And so when I was on the Silk Road, actually it was the Silk Road 2 by the time I was doing this research, um, you had uh, thousands of different products, which you can see over here, being sold by hundreds of different vendors, 30% in the US, 10% of them in the UK. And actually one of the big sellers was uh, from right here in Dublin. I think he's still under arrest awaiting extradition, or, or an administrator rather than a seller, an administrator <coughs> of the Silk Road 2. He's not in the audience, is he? All right, good. <laughs> um, OK, so, so, you're, so, so this is the challenge. So you are a, uh, on this site, and you're looking through all the different products. Now, what do you do when you're faced with this problem on Amazon or eBay? It's pretty obvious what you do, isn't it? We all have this problem. We all go and look at the user reviews and the average score out of five and all the rest of it. Well, that is exactly what you do here. Because every single product, in addition to all this, has detailed feedback from every user who, after using the product, also gives a score out of five on product quality, stealth of delivery, uh, how friendly the vendor was, all the things that, let me see, yeah, all the different sorts of things that you would expect. And that, in fact, rather than the clever encryption is the secret behind why these sites were and still are incredibly popular. So we have huge amounts of competition because there's hundreds of different vendors selling very similar products. We have a functioning feedback system whereby me, the buyer, can choose between different products based on what the different uh, uh, different buyers have said about it. And of course, that introduction of competition and choice creates the kind of dynamic that, the, uh, that every economist would predict. You, you found on this site that the vendors were just unbelievably consumer-centric and friendly. Why wouldn't they be? They're desperate for your repeat custom. And so, to give you an example, I was browsing through the different sites, and I found one, looked good, I think it was based overseas, um, and I didn't want to buy too much, because I didn't want to get into trouble. So I thought, I'm just going to start with a tiny amount of marijuana, but I need to test the site, and I need to get it sent to my home address. 
just to make sure that this thing actually works in the way that it's supposed to. So I email one called Drugs Heaven, and Drugs Heaven has a you know, detailed description and terms and conditions and postage and package, or free postage and package for first orders and all the sorts of offers that you'd expect elsewhere. So I say, dear Drugs Heaven, I'm new to this site. I want to just start with a really small amount. Um, could you recommend what I do? Best wishes. And a couple of hours later, it's like, dear sir, thank you very much for your inquiry. Starting small is a wise thing to do, and that's what I would do if I were you. So no problem if you'd like to start with just one gram of marijuana. Do get back in touch if you have any further questions. Best wishes, Drugs Heaven. And this is, this, this is what happens on these sites. And as a result of that sort of endless competition, you have this sort of explosion of innovation. So one uh, vendor is now purporting to sell fair trade cocaine. Organic, <laughs> sorry, sorry, organic, organic fair trade cocaine that is sourced from, not from, not from Colombian drug lords or anything like that, but from sort of local Guatemalan farmers. And they, he even says that he'll reinvest 10% uh, of all profits in like, local education projects. You have a mystery shopper, someone that goes around testing products and reviewing them, and other people are very, very sort of really pay attention to these detailed reviews. You have a search engine called Grams. It's because, so, so this is, so, let me try to explain the sort of moral dilemma that this has created. Well, before I do, I'll actually just quickly go through the sort of the actual process of getting it, because it's quite interesting how they've innovated the payment systems as well. So once you place your order, you obviously have to, you obviously have to pay somehow. And there was a lot of difficulties with the payment systems, because obviously on these sorts of marketplaces, uh, it's hard to trust people. The key thing is, how do you combine anonymity with trust? What mechanism can you create that I can believe in when I don't know who I'm dealing with? And so everyone pays with the cryptocurrency Bitcoin, and Bitcoin is readily available in exchange for, uh, for normal money, and it's a, sort of, it's a way of giving you, it's not perfect, but it gives you a quite high degree of anonymity to transfer sort of a, 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 a store of a, a, a digital cash, really, to, to buyers and sellers. Now, the problem was that people were sending in their Bitcoin, and then the dealers weren't sending the drugs back. And there isn't really anywhere you can go to complain about that. Although some people have actually gone to the police and complained that their drugs haven't turned up. <laughs> that is a true story. <laughs> so. We had this problem. So the community, the community, and it was really a community of people, sort of came up with a solution called, uh, called multi-signature escrow uh, payments. So I like a product. I decide I'm going to buy the product. I transfer my Bitcoin into a sort of neutral wallet. The vendor doesn't have access to it yet, but sees that it's gone into this neutral wallet. He or she can then send me the product, and when I'm happy and I've received it, two of the three people involved in the transaction, the site administrator, the vendor, the buyer, and the vendor, two of the three sign off on the transaction, and the money is passed over to the vendor. Really simple stuff, but it really, really worked. The other problem is people realize that Bitcoin is not actually that anonymous. The problem is there's a public ledger called a blockchain of every single Bitcoin transaction that ever takes place. And if you're very, very clever, you could piece it together and try and work out who's dealing with whom. And so they came up with something called Bitcoin Fog. There it is up there. There's lots of different versions of this. Essentially, I want to send one Bitcoin to my Silk Road wallet, but I don't want anyone to know it's coming from my desktop. So hundreds of people all send one Bitcoin into a centralized wallet. All those Bitcoins are shuffled around, and then they're sent on to their destinations. But the thing is, they're different Bitcoins, because a Bitcoin is just a string of numbers. So as long as it's not the same string of numbers, but the value's the same, that's perfectly fine. 
It's like a sort of little micro laundering, like a micro laundering system. Brilliant, really clever, and a really neat way to overcome the constant sort of hostile conditions that these marketplaces are, of course, operating under, which is no one trusts anyone. The authorities are always trying to shut them down. And so they're trying to come up with ways to deal with these problems. And that is one of the reasons they have become incredibly innovative and incredibly consumer-centric. Now, here's the moral dilemma. Um, it's not that, that's just a blank screen. <laughs> here's the moral dilemma. And it wasn't the one that I was expecting. Because I went into writing about this subject and writing this book, sort of thinking I was going to lift the lid on this terrible stuff happening online and it was going to be you know, scandalizing people that this stuff was available. But the problem was this. Well, on the one hand, I'm quite certain that these sites make more drugs more readily available to more people more easily. There's no doubt about that. It lowers the barriers to access of drugs, including very hard drugs, very dangerous drugs, not just marijuana, and indeed not just drugs. Munitions, uh, fake identity, and other stuff besides. Now, that's not a good thing. And everything that we know about drugs consumption shows that if you make supply easier to get, then demand will also go up. So these things will, I think, increase the overall level of demand for hard drugs wherever they operate. And I don't think that's a good thing. But on the other hand, you do have, if you are going to buy drugs, you do have, I think, a better way of doing it here than on the streets. When you're buying drugs on the streets, you have very, very few ways of not guaranteeing, but at least trying to predict the purity and the quality of the product that you're getting. So much of the street market is, as I'm sure you're all aware, not suggesting you're <laughs> as I'm sure you're aware from having read it in the newspapers, is cut with mixing agents. The average level of uh, purity of street cocaine in the UK is somewhere between 2 and 20%. On the Silk Road, it was between 60 and 90%. Uh, unbelievably high quality, but more important than that, predictable quality because based on the review system and the very, very active uh, community of users that would be monitoring these markets all the time, you sort of knew what you were going to get. And that is absolutely crucial. In 2011, there was a spate of, of heroin addicts that died. I think it was 11 or 12 heroin addicts died in, Scot in Glasgow alone um, because their heroin had been laced with anthrax. This kind of stuff doesn't happen so much on the Silk Road. It's not perfect by any means. Of course it's not. But we're talking about degrees, and I think it is safer. And not only is it safer for the individual, I think it's probably safer for society uh, because all of the street crime that's associated with pushing drugs on street corners and the wars, that, the sort of petty street wars over those corners, is all kind of stripped away with this. Now, when I looked through, I managed to get hold of 120,000 pieces of feedback that had been left on the Silk Road over a three-month period. Uh, and the average, not the average, the 95% um, of those pieces of feedback scored five out of five. We're talking about very, very happy customers. But there is a serious point behind that. Now... I, in the end, this is why I'm saying it was sort of morally ambiguous, because I kind of came out not being sure and still not entirely sure whether or not I think things like the Silk Road are a good thing for society and whether actually, on balance, I'd rather this was the way people got their drugs or not. Now, just to conclude, why is this... Why is this important? Well, I think this is important because the Silk Road to me and the dark net more generally stands for something bigger. And it's something that isn't going to go away. Um, ever since, not just since the Edward Snowden revelations, but particularly since the Edward Snowden revelations, 
there has been a huge increase in the people that are using the Tor browser for very legitimate reasons, as I've said. There's been a huge increase in the number of people that are working on different ways of keeping people anonymous, hidden, and secure online. Whether it's new types of software, whether it's default encryption messaging systems, there is an explosion of activity, mainly driven by people who are concerned about individuals' internet privacy because they see it as an extremely important condition for freedom of expression and democracy and so on. And that has been going on for at least five or six years, especially actually since more and more surveys are showing in a very, very simple way, the more we share about ourselves online, the more we're worried about what people might be doing with that data. And sharing stuff about ourselves online is now a fact of everyday life. And more and more of us are worried about that, more and more of us are taking measures to defend ourselves against the worst excesses of that, and more and more people are building software to help us stay hidden online. So this question of anonymity and how it can be used and misused is not one that's it's not only not going away, it's just going to become bigger and bigger. And that's kind of the dilemma of the Silk Road writ large. Because I consider all of these developments to be broadly positive. I think there are incredible social and personal benefits for all of us from the greater adoption of these various types of privacy-enhancing software. But be under no illusions that the most motivated people will be the earliest adopters of all of this stuff. That's why it's the fringes that were using Tor hidden services, the dark net, the most. It was the whistleblowers and the journalists, and it's the drug dealers and the illegal pornographers. And that is just going to continue, at least for a while, to be the case. So, you've probably, like many of us, seen with great frustration the way that a group like Islamic State seems to be almost impossible to keep their propaganda offline. Well, one of the reasons is, is because they are using all of this software too. They are using all of these... <sighs> There's no magic about it. All of these messaging services that loads of us now use because we care about our privacy and we don't want everyone knowing what we're writing, well, they're using them as well. Of course they are. And the neo-Nazis have always been early adopters of modern technology. The British National Party in the UK for a long time had by far the best website of any political party, the most visited website. They've been gamifying all of their social media activity for far longer than any other political party. The motivated people on the fringes are always the early adopters. And so that's the kind of dilemma that we are facing. And I think in the end, and this is the kind of message that I always really conclude with about this, you can't really have the benefits without the negative effects. You can't have all the positives from internet freedom and privacy without some groups misusing it. And you know, I think society is just going to have to get used to it. I think all of us are just going to have to get used to the fact that society is going to become more turbulent, Censorship is going to become more difficult. There's going to be many good, good outcomes of that, and there's going to be many negative outcomes of that. And so it's not going to be the case that internet freedom and privacy driven by this type of software is going to lead simply to good things or bad things, but I think a sort of increase, if you like, of both of those things. And with that, I think I'll stop. <coughs> And we can, we're supposed to have a discussion now, aren't we? Yes. Good. So we're going to have a discussion. I'm okay. going to go and sit over here. Thank you very much. Um, there is much more to the book than, uh, than um, drug dealing. Uh, but it is quite a good guide to drug dealing, actually. <laughs> so in a way, I, you know, the book's kind of fallen into that trap. And you know, whether it's on the dark net or not, you know, the information that's on the dark net is now in the book, and it's, it's quite easily available. But what I sort of, and you talk about a lot of the different subcultures from drug dealing and child pornography and various others, 
But for me, reading them, I didn't really think that you know, these were very obscure groups that didn't exist before the Darknet. I just felt that these were real world groups that existed that are just being emulated. So I, you know, I don't think it's, I'm not really sort of convinced that it's going to make the world a worse place. I think it's almost just, you know, it might, okay, it might highlight the fact that they're there, but I think they're there anyway. I think they're there anyway and the behaviors are there, but I think, uh, I think it's in a way too easy to say that the internet is merely a mirror or a reflection of human society. Um, because what I think that it does is simply makes all, really all types of behavior easier. If you want to be nasty and mean and bully complete strangers, if you want to access illegal pornography, drugs, whatever it is, uh, it's much easier to do that now. And maybe it's and, and, and sometimes it's easier to do that by mistake, by accident, drifting in. And I think inevitably, if you lower the barriers to certain types of behaviour, there's certain people that will fall in that wouldn't have otherwise. And I think probably the the worst way that we see that is with illegal pornography. Mm. Um, it's very, very misunderstood what happens here, but a, a, a lot of the sort of journey of people that end up being convicted of possessing illegal pornography start off on legal pornography. They are then constantly presented pop-up images of sort of younger and younger teens, and teenage pornography is by far the most popular category of legal pornography, by the way. Um, and they sort of get sucked in younger and younger ages, almost imperceptibly, mm -hmm. over a course of months or even years, without realizing sort of how much worse things are getting. And because it's so much easier to access, and I mean, it really is, compared to 25 years ago, where the barriers to finding illegal pornography were so high, there's a sort of category of people, and I call them the, the, the browsers, really, the people that almost are curious and they end up getting sucked into this, that 20 years ago, I don't think would have been convicted of this crime. And the problem is, the more people that are convicted of it, the more people end up hearing about it and then go and look for it themselves, the more people continue to supply it and it's a devilishly difficult it's a devilishly difficult problem partly because one third of all illegal pornography referred to the internet watch foundation in the uk last year was produced by young people themselves on their smartphones sure shared amongst themselves and then uploaded which other people then found and put somewhere else on the internet and so it has become incredibly difficult to actually stem the supply of this stuff because of the net and it's because of that that more and more people are getting sucked into it. So there are certain behaviours, I think, that are, at the very least are brought out or exaggerated in a way that wouldn't be without the net. Yeah, yeah. I guess because you make specific reference in the book to um, a guy called Michael, who so by his sort of becomes an accidental child pornographer. He's not a terribly sympathetic character, but he is, you know, you can see the steps of how it's happened. And he, he's still kind of shocked himself to find himself with all these images, and yet he does them. Um, I was really interested in the Internet Watch Foundation, which is an organization based in London. In Cambridge. In Cambridge, and how they protect themselves. So the, this is uh, an organization, and it's a very sort of bland room in the middle of uh, uh, just an uh, industrial estate. Yep. And they look at some of the worst stuff on the Internet, particularly in reference to child pornography. And they have a scale from one to five of uh, sort of illegal to five, which is the worst, because yeah. that's how the scale yeah. works. And, you know, it, it's these people's jobs to go in and look at this stuff. And I'm sort of uh, yeah. horrified, obviously. Um, and they've had quite a lot of success, actually. Um, their figures are kind of impressive in the amount of sites that get shut down. But how do they go about, as individuals, protecting themselves? And how did you sort of go about protecting yourself when you were researching the book? Well, I mean, accessing illegal pornography is a strict liability offence. I mean, I, so I couldn't do anything that would even get me near to that because there's mm. no defence in law, there's no sort of public interest defence. I mean, I had a gram of marijuana sent to my home address and I kind of, I didn't really expect to get arrested for that and um, yeah. I think my agent sort of wanted me to get arrested for that because it would have been a <laughs> press release. We'll see when the sales are going bad in about two <laughs> well, months, you know. Exactly. Um, but, but obviously for that, it's a different, it's a completely different scale, sort of category of problem. So I, that's why I sort of focused in on those groups and mm. an individual story, because I couldn't really break into that world without putting myself at quite a serious risk, legally and sort of psychologically. And uh, yeah, so the, 
The Internet Watch Foundation, it is an, it, one of the things I noticed when I went in there, yes, is how bland the office is, but also that there's no photos, or any family photos at all next to anybody's computers. And they really try to dissociate what they're doing in the day with you know, their personal lives. And I suppose I mean, they have a lot of psychological tests. Um, before, they, uh, before they take the job, they are talked through, they're shown some images as well mm -hmm. under strict supervision, and they're sort of told to go home for the weekend, think about whether you can handle seeing this stuff every day. And a lot of people at that point just can't go back, and they can't do it. But there's a psychologist um, on hand, and they have you know, weekly and monthly and sort of uh, annual tests. And it takes a particular type of person, I think, that's able to dissociate themselves in that way. And they all say that they struggle, but they all say, I've kind of got used to it, and I've kind of been able to separate that thing. And most of them say, I do it because... I hate this stuff so much mm. that I'm willing to put myself through this to try to stop it. Yeah. Um, but in, a, in, a, in another way, um, there was a very broad theme throughout the book, which is how quickly you get used to things mm. on the internet. <laughs> I mean, the hardest chapter for me to, to write about and to research was on pro-anorexia and self-harming sites. You know, sort of huge family of sites, really, really gruesome and graphic imagery. And I spent a lot of time on them. The first couple of days, it was awful. And then by day three or four, I was just completely used to it. It mm. didn't affect me at all. And I'd become so habituated by the images that I no longer found them shocking. And I, yeah. that's a useful evolutionary trait, I think, for humans. But the problem is it can result in you doing really bad things quite quickly without you realizing how serious they are. Sure. One of the points you make in the book, actually, on those anorexia sites, um, and this is a really troubling thing that you kind of, that you know, sort of thrown out there, is that some people on the sites, um, and it's particularly in reference to anorexia sites, so these are sites that people are pro-anorexia, and on suicide sites, um, that some people almost view them as a kind of therapy, and they almost feel like these sites help them uh, survive and help them not uh, kill themselves, and that the rates of suicide haven't actually gone up, even with the advent of those sites. Yeah. I'm just wondering, has there been much more research done on that? Because that, that's kind of terrifying. It's a well, sort of it, terrifying I mean, it, it's, is it that surprising, though? Because for a lot of people with suicidal ideation, as they call it, uh, it they, they just want someone to talk to about it. And the problem is, no one, if you go to, if you present, as they say, if you present to a doctor with this, the first thing they do is send you to a psychiatrist, they put you on medication, antidepressants, and they don't want to do any of that. They just mm. want to talk to people. Well, they want to talk to people who are like them. And it's often, remember, late at night, there's no GPs open, there's no professional sites you can go to and talk openly about this stuff, so they go to these sites. And, yeah, there were many people that credited these sites with having saved their lives because they felt really low, they spoke to people who sort of understood them, and they would write questions and then go to bed knowing when they woke up they had something to check back on to see what people had said and they said sometimes in the darkest moments that is what kept them going and I can sort of understand that and the other yeah. flip side of course is that there are some people who learn very specific techniques for how to commit suicide from these sites as well and a little bit like with the with the drug site there there's that sort of moral ambiguity should uh, should national health services provide something better should we shut them down? I mean, the French government has outlawed pro-anorexia sites and has made it a criminal offence to set them up. 95% of those sites are run by girls who are 16 to 19 with anorexia, and we're making, mm. they're making criminals of them. It's ridiculous, in my view. Yeah. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it, was a really difficult sub, it was a really difficult subject to tackle. Yeah, and it's, it's not even a new problem either. I mean, there's a, I remember being out with the Coast Guard here, and they, we, and a lot of what they do is, you know, dealing with people who uh, will have killed themselves, and they have to recover bodies and things like that. And we were on a rescue team, and they said, "Don't." So one of the guys pointed out, "Oh, that's usually the place that people do it." And he said, "But don't report that and don't say it, because immediately you're going to get a lot of copycats coming in." So it's not like it's a new thing yeah. that maybe the authorities are dealing with. It's just a new form of that thing. Yeah, and that's called the Werther effect after a, a character in Ger one of Goethe's books called The Sorrows of Young Werther, when mm. sort of, yeah, this young romantic 
uh, c killed himself in his novel because he couldn't have the woman he dreamt of or something. And then you had a sp this sort of spate of copycat suicides following it, and you sort of seen it you know, mm. after Marilyn Monroe's suicide. I mean, it, it, and, and so the, uh, people like the Samaritans get very, very worried about that and try to control that, and sort of you're very careful guidelines on how you report suicide because of that. And you're right that what the internet does is, again, it sort of circumnavigates some of that. It, sort of, yeah. it does that Werther effect at a grassroots level. And I certainly saw it in the pro-anorexia sites where people who were you know, on 500 calories a day were sort of worshipped and admired and people mm. would look up to them and wait for their posts and couldn't, you know, it became a community and you... But it's so hard to break into that. Yeah. So hard to break into that and so hard to know what to do. You can diagnose a problem, but then you think, what do you do? Shut them down? Sure. Um, when I first saw the title of the book, just to change the tone of it, um, The Dark Night, I immediately thought of like hackers and cool people yeah. and very dimly lit offices doing deadly things that I don't understand. <laughs> and you actually found a place like this called <laughs> Califu. Mm. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that? Because I found that really fascinating. Yeah, well... So I was just fascinated by Bitcoin and the cryptocurrencies and who's behind it and the ideology behind it. And, um, and there's, there's, there's so many people work... <laughs> people think of a lot of... There's a bit of a war over Bitcoin, this cryptocurrency at the moment, of sort of a war for its soul. Whether it is a financial project, i.e. it's a very smooth payment system... You know, we can transfer money with Bitcoin around the world at split seconds for nothing. And think of the benefits in remittances alone. Amazing. You know when you send money overseas and it costs like 13% or something? It's ridiculous. Why do you have to pay that? Bitcoin, you don't need to pay that. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's outside of the control of central banks. It's a deflationary currency. You can see all the kind of consumer benefits potentially from an instant, secure currency that's purely digital everything else has gone digital but in that way money still is you know hasn't in the same way anyway so there's a lot of people that are sort of working on this as a purely as a as a consumer financial instrument but the origins of bitcoin is really as a political project a political project which was to try to wrestle control of the money supply away from central banks and because it was set up by libertarians who didn't like the fact that central banks were manipulating the money supply. And actually, the radical fringes hoped that with a cryptocurrency that you couldn't really monitor, the government would find it very hard to tax. And if they can't tax you, they can't control you, and so on and so on. And so I found somebody, um, an absolute genius hacker guy called mm -hmm. Amir Taki, who's named as one of the Forbes under sort of next billionaires, but lives as more or less as a homeless person, squatting in places with no money whatsoever. Is that his real name? I mean, yeah, that's his real yeah. name. Um, uh, uh, who, who is working on ways of making Bitcoin, or he was at the time anyway, uh, even more difficult to censor by building a wallet that gave it an extra layer of protection. It's a bit detailed and a bit dull in terms of the technicalities. <laughs> But yeah, and it, it almost was like you'd imagine it to be. Like so many times when I went to different places, it wasn't as I imagined. And that was the interesting thing. You know, I met a neo Nazi who was terrifying online, went and met him, and he's a really friendly guy, and we had a great time in the pub and, you know, chatting. And... But this was exactly how I'd expected dimly lit rooms. Amazing. Smoking, so yeah, and I was like, "This is wow, yeah, this is perfect." Your teenage <laughs> self is delighted. Yeah, exactly. But, th but it, was, it was very, very, uh, it was very interesting to see that. For those people working on cryptocurrencies, they do see it, many of them do see it really as a political project. Mm. And it has that kind of underlying sort of tint of, of, of quite radical libertarianism. Yeah. The one thing I did think, reading about Califu and some of the other places you mentioned, um, some of the, like the libertarians, they seem quite naive um, to me because they seem to think, oh, well, you know, we're going to sort of ignore the capitalist system and not realising that the capitalist system is just waiting to see what opportunities are there to be exploited. Hmm. Which is what it's done with Bitcoin yeah. in so many Perfect. ways. Yeah, it's, exactly. it's, sort of, it's sort of it's co-opted this uh, political project and turned it into a, an instrument of more efficient capitalist exchange. Yeah. Sound like Jeremy Corbyn. Yeah, <laughs> but, but you it's know, bad it has. It, it's exactly exactly what it's it's exactly what it's done. Yeah. I mean, you might say. I mean, there was some rather interesting things. I mean, in Califu, it's a sort of community where they're they're trying to live as as a separate 
enclave, really, that's completely self-sustaining just outside Barcelona. And I'm pretty, I'm really in favour of these kinds of experiments in collective living, because I think we need them. I think we have so many big social problems that actually people that are trying different models, it's really, really welcome. But, you know, every time one of them got ill, they'd jump in the car and drive to the hospital. Fantastic. You know, because, of course, there's, well, what else are they going to do? Yeah. So it was always, it was, it was interesting to see how they were trying to live. And actually, interestingly enough, the hackers, I think, kept upsetting everybody else there because you have all these collective decision-making forums where you you know, raising your hands for this and can we agree on who's doing the cleaning rotor? And a lot of the sort of hacker types were like, we're not getting involved in that, we're just doing our own thing. The sort of individualism of yeah. the sort of you know, a bit more libertarian. If you've got an idea, you go ahead and do it. Don't get involved in this collective decision-making rubbish. Yeah. So there was a bit of a tension there as well. Yeah, which is fine when you've got your mum to clean up after you, but when you don't, <laughs> things start to fall <laughs> apart. Um, maybe we'll take some questions from the audience. Um, there are people with mics, so if you've got a question, just stick your hand up and we'll get a mic to you. And if you could wait until the mic is there, because we're doing a live stream, and if you don't have a mic, people on the live stream can't actually hear you. Yeah, down the front here. We're in the middle, even. Hi, thanks very much for that interesting talk. I thought it was very enlightening. I have two questions. Uh, one, uh, the mainstream internet is very discoverable through the use of search engines, which pretty much uh, go around indexing all the content they can find. Is there an equivalent on the dark net? Uh, how discoverable is the, are the different websites in the dark net? And two, I just noticed from the screenshots you showed, there was a distinct lack of the one thing that curses the mainstream internet, advertising. The, I didn't see any banner ads or the modern equivalent of pop-ups. Are they there? And uh, is that a big problem? Yeah. yeah. Right. <coughs> In reverse order. No, they're not really there. And that's one of the reasons I think it might become very popular, because everyone's getting pissed off with banner ads. And banner ads are following you around because they're tracking your browser history and they know your IP address. And this obviously gets rid of all of that. So I get approached by a lot of advertising companies saying, you know, the banner advertising is less and less effective. It's targeting fewer and fewer people because peop other, you know, people are starting to use stuff like this. Um, and, and people aren't clicking on them anymore because they're just saturated with it. What's the new business model? And I say, I don't know. <laughs> That's my answer. I really don't know. And that could be a problem, though, because a lot of the amazing free services that we get, like amazing Gmail, which is incredible for free, uh, is because they're selling advertising mm. space. But if no one's clicking on it, they can't. That's not a viable model for them anymore. So there's going to be, I think, some interesting changes in the business models of a lot of these companies. And I don't know exactly where and how but I can certainly see it happening. I mean, if, if Mozilla, for example, adds a default ad block on all of its browsers, suddenly the advertising industry loses an enormous chunk of money. And that could happen. So I think things are going to change in that respect. And you're right, when you look on there, you don't see any of that stuff. And it doesn't really exist. I mean, People are trying to work out if there's a way of doing it that's not sort of IP-based or browser history-based. So Grams, that search engine I showed you, I think they sell advertising space. But that's just because everyone, if you type in cocaine, a few things will pop up for other people. You know, like if you typed in cocaine on your search, um, here's some ads. For, mm. I mean, yes, it could be for cocaine, but think about it. It could also be for um, uh, drug scope. If you have an issue with drugs, here's a number that you might want to call. Click on our thing. So there's potentially some interesting ways that you could think about some social goods that can come of that, but it's a long way behind. Um, and your, I, what was the first question now? Is there a Google? Is there oh, a, is there a Google? Google yes, search? yes. There are some search engines that search darknet sites, but it's, it's not linked together in the same way. Um, the way that Google works is it just sort of follows links around, and so it can see how different sites are linked to each other. But a lot of people set up these Tor hidden services and don't link them to anything at all. So they're very hard to find in that, in that sort of crawling manner because they don't, the leads don't go anywhere or there aren't any leads to follow. Which is why when I gave you the estimate of how many sites there were, it's between five and 50,000 because no one's really sure how many hidden ones exist. 
Um, the way people tend to navigate it is that there's usually a number of what are called index pages where people upload the links to the most popular sites. So you go on there first, and then you find links to all these different sites. Um, and they're sort of listed according to commercial services, political activism, and so on and so on. But one of the terrifying things about that is you scrolling down this like wiki page of links, and you might you have the most mundane links or sort of beneficial positive links about political activism, or whistleblowing sites, a library, a discussion forum, and then right underneath that you have a load of lists for illegal pornography. And it's just such a strange thing to see them next to each other and to see it being seemingly so easy to mm. access. So that's the way that most people navigate it, but that in itself can be quite sort of quite troubling when you mm. see it. Mm. Anyone else? Yeah, one down the front here. You're so close, but you can't talk until yeah. the mic Sorry. gets it. <laughs> and then maybe we'll go over to the lady over there as well. What's the risk of, of just buying, say, 10 bitcoins? There'd be about two and a half thousand uh, dollars to buy. It could half in price or it could double in price. It's a very... You've just, well, you've just explained it. You've just answered the question. <laughs> I mean, it, it was very... When Bitcoin was, for a while, uh, the majority of Bitcoin transactions were taking place on these dark net markets. So it wasn't very diversified currency, which is why the site gets shut down and the value of Bitcoin plummets. And then I think it was Ben Bernanke um, or someone, one of the chairmen of the Federal Reserve, said Bitcoin could one day become a viable currency. Number two on the assassination list. Well, here. ironically, yeah. <laughs> and suddenly the value of Bitcoin shot up to $1,000. I think over the last few months, as it's become far more diversified, more investors have got involved, huge investors as well, it's actually stab it's sort of stabilised. And it's yeah, all sort of fluctuating between $250 and $300 and, uh, per Bitcoin. Which is so frustrating when you, like, five years ago, it was at one cent or yeah. 10 cents. You think of and I think there's a lot of drug dealers who made, who were, you know, dealing small amounts of drugs on these sites before the value of Bitcoin went through the roof and suddenly became millionaires yeah. as a result. And I mean, all of that, that's just currency. That's got nothing to do with digital or not. I mean, that the only reason... Well, only, the that it's, only, that it's, uh, well, only that it's new, so people are sort of seeing it as a somewhere between a currency and a commodity. Yeah. Because it's not in wide circulation or wide use yet. So a lot of people just do it for pure speculation. And, yeah. and, 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 and Bitcoin may be, sort of because it's stabilised now, because there's so many people buying and selling it, actually others are turning to the new cryptocurrencies. There's hundreds of... You could go and make your own cryptocurrency today if you wanted. The source code's all open. And what's your first name? Barry, Barry coin. We can make a Barry coin tomorrow and you can sell them, you know, you can set the rate at whatever. I think Science Gallery are going to do a workshop on it next <laughs> week, actually. Um, I just wanted to talk, um, you talked briefly about uh, the need for people to protect their identity online. Um, what do you think the future of, of cookies is in terms of merging first and third party data for commercial purposes? Huh. Um... Uh, that's a difficult question. Um, what, the way I can see it evolving is more and more people take... It basically becomes a bit of a weird arms race between users and companies. So more and more users try and stop sharing their data. Uh, but to make the business viable, uh, companies need ever more targeted advertising so they can increase the click rates so they can sell it and say and sell the advertising space as being like unbelievably precise <coughs> about everything this individual's ever looked at and bought and their age and their demographic and all the rest of it. Um, and so the companies <coughs> are going to be trying to get ever more precise types of data, merging it with different data sets, merging, it, mer merging their enormous online browser data sets with electoral register data or you know, some of the other... Like, there's huge data sets out there that have nothing to do with the internet that consumer groups have had for years and years. Uh, credit card company data and all of that stuff. You know, there's so much out there. And you merge that 
They're called data brokers. Axiom's one of the biggest, and you know, they've got records on millions of people. You merge those offline and online data sets to get more detail on location and household and neighborhood, and they're going to have to do that because that's the only way they can increase the click rates, which keeps the business model viable. And the more they do that, the more people are going to get pissed off and feel really uneasy with how much information these companies have about them, and will start using more and more of this stuff, which means they'll have to get more and more data to make the remaining people click more. Mm. And it just, to me, it feels like it's just going to get a tighter and tighter knot. And that's why I feel like it's going to be quite turbulent in the years ahead. And I wouldn't be surprised, certainly, if some of the... There's going to be more and more sort of freemium models where people... You get some free stuff with Google, but actually, if you want our secure email, then it's going to cost you $10 a, 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 a year or whatever. And <clears throat> the interesting thing, I think, is that probably all of us have come to see things like Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and Google as public utilities. Like, how dare you charge us for that? That is a free thing that we should all have. That's a, it's a free space. It's, a, it's, it's not a free space. It's owned by someone in another country, with sh a company with shareholders. And they can do whatever the hell they like with that. And they can censor it if they want, and they can charge if they want. But okay. we're not going to accept that, because the sort of de facto public space has become Twitter and YouTube and Facebook. It's vital for our democracy. But what if they decide to start charging for it? And then what happens? And then big money starts running it, but our democracy depends on it. That's my next book, maybe. Because hmm. it's a big problem. And it's one that's maybe not yet, 10, 20 years down the line, though, I think it's going to become a really... So who owns the space? Yeah. Hmm. Um, I was quite intrigued by uh, the model that Dilemmas you described between certain use cases that of uh, the dark web and Tor, et cetera, that might, where, where the use cases they make possible might be preferable to the way they're done online, potentially preferable anyway, say with drug trade, where say you yeah. could argue people are gonna buy them anyway, and with the trust system, you actually achieve harm reduction because your heroin won't be cut with anthrax or washing powder or whatever. Mm. Uh, and then we might have other use cases where no, it's the ease of affordability is not preferable, say with child pornography, yeah. where it will lead to more exploitation yeah. of minors. And so what, I'm sure you spend a lot of time thinking about these various use cases and where it might be and might not be preferable to have them uh, easier through uh, the dark web. So what, uh, when you're thinking about these, what criteria would you use to kind yeah. of veer in one direction or the other? Or what criteria might we use to say, this is actually preferable or might be preferable, whereas it isn't. <laughs> Legislate. Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that is the, that's the sort of killer question, and it, I think it depends on your political philosophy, really. Uh, certainly on the Silk Road, the sort of, and they, it was a libert, sort of a libertarian project, the Silk Road. It was more than just buying and selling drugs. I think it was also a kind of, we're going to create a perfect marketplace that the government can't control. But they had, as libertarians, their restrictions were uh, nothing that harms uh, children, so illegal pornography is off. Um, but if you're an adult and you want to put drugs in your body, that's your choice. Um, and uh, fake identification and guns, they also didn't want to have anything to do with it because it can cause direct harm to other people, whereas drugs is about harming yourself. Mm. So they sort of selected that, you know, sort of reasonable, I suppose. Of course, the problem is that there's all of these secondary harms. So when um, Ross Ulbricht was tried and convicted and got multiple life sentences for running the Silk Road, a lot of people made the harm reduction argument. And the judge in the case rejected them and said, the problem is it's creating huge amounts of harm in Colombia and Mexico because it's in keeping the demand going, which is keeping the supply going, which is fueling the wars in those areas, and people are dying. Well, so, well, yeah, definitely, that's completely true. And so I, don't, I, I honestly, I don't have an answer for, for you on that question. Uh, and I have thought about it a lot and not really come to a broader conclusion. I'm sort of liberal by default on these things, but recognize that there's sort of a set of other harms that mm. come uh, indirectly from certain behaviours, and you try and limit or minimise those. Um, all that I think is important is that when we're making these decisions, we actually look and see what's really happening on these sites. 
because I feel like there's a huge amount of misunderstanding, whether it's how these sites work or how illegal pornography uh, actually works, um, and not to defend that in any way. I mean, actually, it's, I think it's in many cases far worse than people realise about how hard it is to prevent that and what do we do in response. Uh, whether it's neo-Nazis, these pro-anorexia, pro-suicide sites, when do you ever hear the case that actually some people say it's helped them stay alive? Never. You only ever hear that they're places where people go to be tricked and conned into killing themselves, and that is not true. So at the very least, I would hope that we could be a bit more informed in the discussions we have about it, but that's going to require a lot more. This is a very, very shallow look at all of this stuff. It's going to require an awful lot more serious digital investigation into these places. And the problem is that can lead you into quite difficult territory. Because I've been asked by loads of journalists or other journalists, can you buy guns on, the, on these dark net markets? Well, it's only one way of finding out. I'm not going to try because I'll get arrested for that, definitely. I don't want to get arrested. But, so how are we going to do the kind of public interest journalism in some of this stuff? Because it's really, really dangerous. And I don't think enough of it happens. And when not enough of it happens, it becomes hysterical and alarming the way it's reported. So I just want people to start doing a little bit more of this type of journalism so at the very least we have slightly more informed discussions about these issues. Yeah. And in that, uh, I think we've probably time for one more question. We'll go with the gentleman in the middle there. It's just a very quick one, um, just picking up on a point. You mentioned that Facebook are opening a link on the Tor network. Yeah. Uh, just some background as to why they might be doing that. Yeah, well, they, 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 they opened it, it uh, about six months ago, I think. Um, so it's a Dot Onion site there. And, and the, one of the main reasons they did it, I mean, you might say there's a sort of commercial reason. They want to show that they do care about your privacy because not only that, they've also added, uh, you can send encrypted messages as well on their messenger system, which is another sort of, you know, we do care about your privacy kind of statement. Um, one of the main reasons is because I think they're worried about what you might call man-in-the-middle attacks uh, or spoof Facebook accounts. So uh, a bad government will set up some fake Facebook.com accounts that people get redirected to, and actually you're giving away all of your information. That is very, very hard to do if it's a Tor hidden service. Actually, if you want to access Facebook and be sure it's going to Facebook and be a bit more confident that you're not being hacked in the middle your traffic isn't being hacked in the middle. If you go on there using the Tor browser on to the Tor hidden service version of Facebook, it is more secure. It is more secure for you as a user. Hmm. Now, that to me, the fact that there's that benefit to the user and to Facebook by saying, you know, you can be sure you're with us, is a reason I can see a lot of other companies wanting to go to uh, Tor hidden service. Um, it sounds really dark, Tor hidden service, you need a browser, the dark net. It's just a browser and a, inter it's a URL. Like it's, it's as easy as going to anywhere else on the internet. It doesn't feel like it's very sophisticated or difficult, it's just a lot more secure. It's a browser that you click on and you go to a URL and you go to a website. It's so simple. Um, I mean, cyberspace is completely flat. It doesn't have layers and depth or anything. So the problem is it's not a big enough network yet. But this is the thing. Like, if Facebook goes there and more people join, this happened in the early 90s. Uh, if Facebook goes there and joins, we go there, I create a blog, you join because you like my blog, and then someone joins because they like your comments on my blog, and then they set up a blog. And, you, and then it becomes an exponential growth because everyone goes because everyone else is going. And so it's quite possible that this dark net becomes much bigger quickly because it becomes the exciting, interesting place to go. And I think that's where it might be at the moment. I mean, I sort of see, I see parents chasing their kids around the internet. The kids join Facebook and the parents join Facebook, so the kids leave Facebook and go to Snapchat, and then the parents go to Snapchat, and they're just basically following each other around. And if I know, if I was 16, I'd go onto the dark now, and be like, you're not going to find me here. Yeah. <laughs> And it's sort of cool and exciting because Edward Snowden talked about it and musicians are uploading their songs on there and there's a 
website where you can see drugs and stuff. I mean, it's the sort of place that I can imagine you'd want to go when you were young, and it's quite cool and exciting, but it's also incredibly dangerous. Yeah. But hopefully, if more and more people go on there, it actually stops becoming dangerous. It becomes normal. It just becomes the normal place people go. Uh, and there's more community pressure, so the bad stuff gets sort of pushed to one side. There's more ordinary stuff, but everyone's a little bit more secure on there. They can be a little bit more sure that their data's not being looked at and so on. And if we can get to that, I think that, is a, that would be a really nice place to end up. Yeah, and you can come back in two years and hear Jamie's new book on the Darknet 3.0, <laughs> where the really nasty stuff is on. Um, Jamie's going to be around for a little while. The book is for sale. If you want signings or questions, uh, do come up and ask. Thank you very much. Thank you.